Hey everybody, it's Andy. Welcome back to my weekly show where I help you build a career you love. Today we're going to be talking about third party and executive recruiters and everything you want to know. I promise this one is going to be fun. We are going to talk about who these people are, how they work, why they're so misunderstood, all the myths about them, and how you can have the best relationship working with them. And if you're wondering where I'm coming at you with this stuff from, I am a long time executive search firm owner and an executive recruiter, an international top 100 recruiter, in fact, in 2015, and uh, written a gold award winning hiring book and have surveyed tens of thousands of recruiters, executive recruiters, HR people, all of those folks that play a part in this. So I'm coming at you with personal experience. I'm also coming at you with some science and some data to back what I'm going to tell you. And I, I actually, I laughed. Some of you might have caught this on social media this week. When I say I got a lot to tell you, I actually <laughs> measured this as a half an inch of index cards. That's right. I'm going to talk really fast. We got a lot of stuff to go through. It'll take about a half an hour or so, but I want to give you... I want to give you everything. We're going to go through who they are, all the myths. I got 10 of those, what you should be doing at every stage in interacting with them to get the most out of their, uh, out of your relationship with them. If you're here with me live, uh, get in the chat, say hello. I always know where, I always love to know where you're from, what you do, what you need. If you got any questions, put some question marks in front of, in front of your questions. The chat gets pretty lively. If you're watching me on the recording, just put it, put them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer it. All right, so let's talk about, let's talk about who we're actually speaking about. Get our terms in order today. We're talking about a third party of some sort. So what this really is, is, these recruiters are their own entity, whether they're an individual, whether they work on behalf of a business or a search firm or whatever it is, but they they are their own entity that is working on behalf of an organization, some company that has actually hired them to go out and recruit somebody of a specific makeup, uh, particular skill sets, particular experience, and so on. So they are working for a particular organization, as opposed to uh, corporate recruiters who are usually an internal employee of the organization on which behalf they are recruiting you. I actually did a whole talk on working with corporate recruiters uh, months back. We'll put the link up in the in the recording for you. But you can also find out everything you want to know about working with corporate recruiters. And then the other party that we're talking, you know, that, that kind of falls into this category is staffing firms. And when I say staffing firms, I'm talking about individuals who are usually uh, working on behalf of organizations to find temporary resources. So somebody who they likely are going to be charging by the hour. Uh, typically what happens is the organization will pay the staffing firm some rate to have a, a contractor, a consultant, or some sort of independent working for a temporary period of time. We're not speaking about them. So when I say today third parties or executive recruiters, I'm talking about somebody who is helping you, looking to recruit you on behalf of another organization and do not get misled by the term executive recruiter. Individuals at any level can be recruited by recruitment firms who specialize in those particular resources. So there are recruitment firms that uh, help organizations find permanent administrators or executive assistants or office managers or whatever. And there are other org organizations that are much larger that, that help people, uh, organizations find executives. So, so what we're talking about here is just any of you are, are certainly susceptible to being contacted by one of these people. That's what I'm talking about. All right, third parties. Now, let's talk about exactly who they are, okay? Who they are. These individuals, and, and what I'm about to tell you right now may be obvious to some. It's probably not obvious to everybody especially because of the loads of comments and questions that I get on my blog and via email and on my YouTube channel about why recruiters are not calling me back. And we're going to go through all that. Recruiters find people for jobs. They do not find jobs for people. They are driven based on the requests and the payments of their clients who are companies who've asked them to go out and look for somebody specific. 
Okay, so the reason why a lot of you aren't getting callbacks when you reach into these types of firms is because they're busy looking for somebody other than you. It's not personal, but they find people for jobs, not jobs for people. Now, one of the other things that I want you to recognize when it comes to these individuals, because I know lots of times we kind of beat them up and we laugh at them, uh, to give you just to give you some perspective, and I want to do this kind of sprinkled throughout. Some of this is important for you to know. Some of it's nice to know. For in the recruiting profession, so somebody who is literally a recruiter on their own or for a company that is that is not a corporate recruiter, not a staffing firm, there is an eighty percent failure rate for these people at this profession within the first twelve months. That's eight out of ten of them are no longer recruiters within one year of starting this profession. That's how difficult this is, and, and for so many reasons. And the 20% that make it to the second year, 50% of them don't make it to the third year. So just go, go a little easy on them. Have, have a bit of respect for individuals who've been longtime recruiters. It's, it's important uh, that you, you kind of understand what they go through as well. They also have their issues with their, with their clients, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, let's talk about the different kinds of recruiters. Here, this is kind of a nice to know, but I also figured it was important for you to know because a number of you ask me, you know, why do I get contacted by multiple recruiters for the same position? Things, questions of this nature. So let's 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 clear up some of that. There are several different kinds of recruiters, uh, but but for purposes of our discussion, there are two: retained and contingent. And I just want to give you some really broad strokes about what these kind of recruiters are. A retained recruiter is an or it's an organization or a firm where a company is hiring them to go out and recruit a particular uh, individual or set of individuals for particular skill set, background, and so on. Usually, that firm is paid up front and along the way, and at the completion of the process, of the recruitment process, there's designated dollars, the fees are negotiated, but what's important for you to know about this is the this firm is getting paid for its expertise to manage the process, go out and recruit, and get the right person to say yes, and it usually usually it makes sense for this to be an exclusive relationship, meaning the organization that is hiring uh, Mile Walk or some other retained search firm is only using that firm to go out and get those individuals or individual, whatever the case may be. Contingent recruiters are just that. Uh, they work on a contingency basis where typically, here again typically, they do not get paid anything unless the company who is co contracted with them actually hires somebody. So if, if we were a contingency recruitment firm, we would take a search, there would be no money exchanged, uh, the, the search firm would bear all the financial risk, the time risk, and so on, to go out into the market and try to find somebody that they could place with their client. Now, typically, typically if a company is smart, they will focus on one contingency search firm, but a lot of them like to use multiple contingency search firms to, to surface individuals for the very same position because in their mind, hey, it's not costing me anything financially. I'll have three firms out there looking for my one project manager and perhaps I will find it three times as fast. The logic is incredibly faulty. You know, Companies bump into each other out there. It kind of looks bad, kind of bad form, but usually... Contingent search firm owners or recruiters are not working on an exclusive basis. Not always. Usually depends on the relationship that they and the strength of the relationship that they have with their organization or with their client. Now, not that this is of all that you know important, but I do want to mention it because based on my analysis, our surveys of contingent firm owners or contingent recruiters and retained recruiters. Uh, contingent recruiters actually earn more. Uh, they pocket more money, um, maybe not percentage-wise of the fee, but in total annually, they typically earn more for many reasons, not the least of which is if their organization or the client that they're representing is not operating effectively, they can quit and run because 
they, they haven't taken any money, you're not behaving effectively, you're not doing the right things in order to secure the right people or, or helping us do that. If you're not going to be a great client, we're just going to dash off where retained search firms can't do that because they're, they're, they're being paid for the process. So there's a lot of nuances. The important thing I want you to know is there's generally two different kinds, retained and contingent. They can operate at all levels. So don't think, well, because I'm a senior person, I'm only going to be dealing with retained firms or contingency firms or whatever. I just wanted you to, I wanted you to know that. Now let's talk about this. I'm going to run through 10 myths, mistakes, misunderstandings, mishaps, you name it. And let's run through these because I want to give you some context. And then after we run through these, I'll actually give you uh, exactly what I'd like you to do. I might sprinkle a little of this in along the way. But this is, um, this is important. Wait, I got to take, I got, <laughs> I got the chicken's cup today. Mm. We've been constantly cleaning out the chicken coop because it's been raining every day. All right, let's get back to the recruiters. So let's talk about the myths, and I want to categorize them into, I don't know, three or four different groupings, but I want to talk about a few where you are trying to contact them. The biggest mistake that people make is not that they are actually trying to contact search firms or executive recruiters, but to the extent to which they do it, that they're making that a primary focal point of their job search. When the fact of the matter is, wrap your mind around this stat, you've probably got less than a 3% chance of being placed in your next position by an executive recruiter. Think about, think about what you're doing. You're trying to contact somebody who might have a plate full of searches that he or she is doing. They're looking for very specific types of individuals. The chance that you are exactly what they need at the moment that they need it is rare. It's like, it's like, run into the convenience store every day for a week trying to buy lotto tickets because you need money. I mean, that, that's, that's in fact what that is like. And people are spending an inordinate amount of time chasing people who they shouldn't be chasing. The percentage of them actually being successful in connecting with these individuals and being the right person at the right time is almost nil. How about this one? Well, but I'm super awesome and my, I'm a star in my space and in my market and in my company, and I'm a straight A worker all the time, why are they not calling me back? It makes no difference to me how awesome you are at what you do if I'm you know, un underneath a, a pile of rocks trying to find you know, this information technology project manager for that small consulting firm when you're the best ever healthcare project manager. Then it, 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 it's nothing. It's like you don't even exist to me at the moment. It, 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 it's actually what's happening. It makes no difference how great you are at what you do. If that's not what I need at the moment, even if I search for healthcare project managers, I cannot take time out of my schedule as a recruiter to take time to talk to you when I have seven clients breathing down my neck for all these other positions that are not you at the moment. They are either paying me or that's my opportunity to earn and service them. So keep, keep that in mind. Here's another one. But I'm super senior, so I should only work with search firms or you know international search firms or I'm the CEO of this or that. You know, th this doesn't matter either. Just because you're senior doesn't mean you should be chasing search firms. And just because you're senior doesn't mean you can't go direct. And just because you're senior doesn't mean that the rec head recruiter at some company isn't the one who's responsible for searching for you. Or maybe you are going to be a practice leader in their organization. Maybe you're going to be the senior vice president of sales and marketing. Not everybody pays for third party search firms. So, again, make executive recruiters a compliment in your in your portfolio of job searching activities this one always cracks me up well i'm a career changer so i need to target recruiters who work in that space so that they can help introduce me to organizations who need resources like the one i want to be this is the actual worst situation think about what you're doing based on what i just said you don't have experience in these particular roles or jobs or markets or whatever, and you want a recruiter who's being paid by a company to go find them somebody who is an expert at that, at that level, in this space, at that function. You'll never get a return call if you are a career changer unless, you know, your best friends. I mean, it just, 
and somebody wants to you know be nice and give you some counsel but there the likelihood that you would get placed by an executive recruiter while you're making a career change is is less than 0.1 percent it, it's really that minuscule so don't waste any any of your time doing that now let's talk about this one how about when they contact you when they contact you all right so you guys know how this goes right you know i'm sure uh some of you are out there going, oh, I get contacted by recruiters all the time. Some of you are out there going, I don't ever get contacted by recruiters. But I want you to think about this. When, when they contact you, and, 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 and now it, so they used to call you on the phone. I, when I started, I would call everybody on the phone. Now nobody picks up their cell phone or their work phone or whatever throughout the day unless they know who's calling. Right, so, so now what recruiters do, thanks to LinkedIn and all the different packages that recruiters have to, or that LinkedIn has to help recruiters, and the fact that apparently nobody knows how to talk to anybody anymore, and nobody knows how to do anything other than email and tweet and fax, and, or, and, and text I should say. So what do they do? They email you. When they email you, they might say something to you and introduce themselves to you, and the really bad recruiters will say, hey, I got this job, here it is, are you interested? Now, when you, or, or hey, I'm searching for a position, I, I'm looking for a system administrator, uh, and I thought you, know, you might be interested in talking with me, and you're thinking to yourself, did that person even look at my background and notice that I'm a database architect and not a system administrator? Right, this happens, right? I, I, I'm guessing a lot of you, this happens, right? And what's the first thing that goes through your mind? Did the recruiter even look at my background? Well, I got news for you. That recruiter probably did in some form or fashion very quickly, or that recruiter asked his or her uh, uh, researcher to use their account, this is very common, and use their account and send you an email. And he probably, you know, he probably said to the to the researcher, "Hey, can you just identify people that have some technology in their background? Just reach out to them. Let's go out there. Let's go after a lot of people. Let's see who gets back to us. Let's kind of vet them out when they do, and so forth." That's what's happening a lot now. For you, it doesn't matter whether they miss the mark or not. The fact is, you got an inbound inquiry. And you should be thinking of it as a golden opportunity to get that person on the phone and get some dialogue going. How about, and I'll, I'll talk to you about how to do that. So did they even look? Or, or the really lazy recruiters, this is really terrible. You know, but that job's not for me. It makes no difference if they send the job description, if they don't send the job description. If this thing is not for you, that's not the point get back to them because there are some opportunities that are going to present themselves once you get on the phone. But if you self-select yourself out, it's dead. It can't go anywhere. It can't go anywhere. So for all of you that are actually employed, because I know we've got a number of employed people who come here for the career development, and as a matter of fact, this topic right now should be for a lot of people who are employed because you want to be ready when somebody actually contacts you. But that's a golden opportunity for you to actually speak to them to speak to them. All right, how about this one? So let's talk about this category. All right, so after you connect with them, so somehow they got to you, you got to them, you guys decided that you would have a phone call, you had this nice call, but you didn't get any call back, okay? And then I get emails that say, well, I had this call with a recruiter and the recruiter told me that he or she was going to present me to their client or they didn't really say anything and I've been emailing them and they're not getting back to me and so on. So first thing is you have to recognize there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Their client could have called them the minute you got off the phone with them and said, the search is over, some other search firm filled it. Or we decided we want to change the requirements of the position. This, they do this stuff, right? This is why contingent recruiters can run and retain recruiters can't. We decided we want to change the, the, the skill sets or we also want them to have this or that. They tell the recruiter, you don't happen to have that. The recruiter doesn't have very good etiquette, does, decides not to call you. Maybe the recruiter is in the process of interviewing other candidates, right? So you, you should get some kind of indication of the, of, with the recruiter, with the recruiter um, about what the next steps are. So just, just, keep, just, keep, just keep that in mind. How about this one? Well, they won't, you know, they won't send me the JD. So, you know, the, the recruiter, either you, either they won't email it to you 
or be, before you talk, or you've made connect, you made a connection, and they don't want to tell you who their client is, or send you the job description. Why? Why don't they want to do that? Well, the first thing that you got to recognize, and we're going to go into this a bit more as we get into the section about what you should be doing. But when, a, when an executive recruiter, third-party search firm, any of those folks are reaching out to you and you're getting on the phone, the thing that they very much value, a person who wants to get on the phone with you, is the long-term relationship with you. If the job description that they immediately give you in the email allows you to select yourself out, you can't build that relationship. The other thing is the job description itself is not the job, just like your resume is not you. Okay, So if they send you the job description and all of a sudden you read it in two minutes, you say, well, I'm not interested in this, you're going to kill, you're going to kill the relationship prematurely. The other thing, more psychologically, is I, as an executive recruiter, would like to understand from you what it is that you want, what you love, what you don't, right? All you boot campers that are out there, what's the first thing that we do when we talk about getting your requirements in order? These are the kind of things that help a recruiter understand what you're interested in. If I know as a third-party recruiter what that job looks like, I know the company, I know the boss, I know these people, what the culture's like, and you're describing something that is similar to that, awesome, I know I got a match, and you're not, your thinking is not being polluted by something that's in front of you, or you're not rationalizing what you like or don't like, because if I hand you a job description and you start rationalizing, I don't know you're rationalizing. I need to know that, because I need to make sure that I'm looking for a good match for you, who I'm now trying to build a relationship with, and my customer, who is my client who's paying me to get a good person. So if, if, if somebody doesn't want to give you the job description, you, you should, number one, be immediately thinking, that's awesome because now I'm not going to be interrupted or skewed in the way I think about what I want. The second thing is, the longer that that recruiter is asking you questions about you, the better. The more the recruiter will understand you. The recruiter is now investing time in building the relationship with you, not just hit, hit and run, you know, do you want this job? No, I'll see you later. That doesn't, that doesn't do either of you any good. It doesn't do either of you any good. The minute you start putting the job description in front of you, it, it's more for these reasons, not so much that I care you're gonna do an end around me, because you're gonna be at a disadvantage if you bypass me, which we're gonna get to in a minute. So I just, I want you to think about that. Oh, look at this, this next card. I shot a whole video on this one. Should I bypass the recruiter? Should I bypass the third party recruiter? No, and I, I wanna say almost never. Why? Well, if I reach out to you and I'm building a relationship with you and I'm trying to assess whether you're a good fit or whether you're not and I have to go through my due diligence and I have to evaluate the candidates and it takes me a few days or a week or whatever and all of a sudden you go in direct and I'm a contingent recruiter, sometimes even a retained recruiter, and you go in direct, now number one, I'm not going to get credit if they ultimately hire you. Number two, you can bet that that company is gonna call me and let me know that they're interviewing you. And I'm gonna say, oh, you found somebody through your portal. What is his or her name? We jot it down. They tell us, what do you think we're gonna say? We were in the process of interviewing them. I wasn't wowed. I was still going through my due diligence. These were the issues I saw. That happens, that will happen. Think about the advantage you will have if you go through the recruiter who can prep you, debrief you, guide you, share with you intelligence that you otherwise would not have on the job, the company, the interviewers, and so on. It is to your advantage. Now, if the recruiter gets with you, whether you meet in person, whether you talk on the phone, and tells you who the company is, what the job is, and doesn't get back to you, and you're trying to call them to try to find out, hey, what's the next step? I really want to be proper and have the right etiquette and work through you, and they are never getting back to you, then yeah, go ahead, go direct. But you need to give them a little bit of time and you need to try to get them to respond to you and give you some, manage your expectations in some way of what is going to be next. Now, here's another one. Should I pay them? Okay, so recruiters themselves, the kind we're talking about, you should never pay. They get paid by the companies. That's the whole point. However, there are, there are, 
firms that are out there that are the absolute biggest scams in the world. And I'll tell you why. Oh, they're legit businesses for sure. And they get people to pay them eight or 10 grand to say, hey, you know, so and so, you're a you're a pretty senior, you're you're a pretty senior gal. You know, practice director level. You know, we've got a lot of relationships with these types of organ, you know, consumer product goods organizations in this space nationally. And if you pay us and give us some information, we will go and we will reach out to our 2000 company database and see if we can help you get placed. We are a window into the employment market for you. It's a total bunch of bunk. So first thing is what they do is they talk to you for a few minutes. They jot down some notes. They get your resume. Maybe they help you clean it up a little. Maybe they even help you with a cover letter. Okay. Then what they do is they don't talk to me. They don't talk to the they the recruitment firm owners. Now, this is another firm. You got recruitment firm owners, people like me that are windows into the employment market. You have companies that they will target on your behalf. And here's what they do. They spray your resume all over the place, hoping that somebody that they don't know that they somehow have gotten this individual to say, yes, I would welcome any and all resumes that you would like to send me. And then they just keep sending them. And a lot of times they're sending them to people who they don't know, like me. I mean, I would get dozens of these every day from different firms. And then all, you know, the letters would look the same. The resume layouts would look the same and so on. So what they're doing is they're just spraying out there and hoping and their appeal to me as a recruitment firm owner is you don't need to worry. You don't need to pay us because the, 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 the candidate paid us. And then what they do with the companies that they're working with is the company probably doesn't even pay them or pays them a small amount of money, depending on whether they're successful or not, or whether they hire somebody. So it's a total scam. Don't do it. Believe me, you will be far better off if you take control of your networking, your search and so forth, but you should never pay them, ever pay them. All right, now let's talk about what you should do. Okay, so those were 10 things that I want you to be really careful about and understand. All right, first thing, I want you to change your mindset. Yes, I want you to change your mindset. Okay, what, what do I mean by this? It's okay if you contact a recruiter, all right? But if the recruiter contacts you, the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to completely think backwards, okay? Don't think about what could the recruiter do for me. Think about what could I do for the recruiter. If you remember, okay, they are a window into the employment market. They're actually a door. The chances that they're going to connect, even if they call you, at that moment that they're going to have the right type of job at the exact right place is remote. It happens. That's what I do for a living. But the, the percentage is low. You've got to be thinking long term. So what most of you are thinking is, all right, I need something right now. What can this recruiter do for me? Instead of, hey, this is somebody who's around employment every single day. If I can build a relationship with a dozen of these people, you'd be in fat city. But what do you do? You think you think short term. You need to think long term. You need to think that even though I need a job right now or or I don't need a job right now and I'm fat, dumb and happy in what I do, you got to be thinking long term. OK, you really you really need to do that. And the best way to build a relationship is what to give. If your mentality is, wow, somebody called me and I now have an opportunity to give this person something. I'm going to give first, which is rule number one of networking and professional relationship building. What do I do with all of you, right? I give you 200 videos, 18 different web, you know, web series, a variety, all this stuff because I want to give out the goodwill. And I know that not all of you will go and enroll in programs or get my coaching or whatever, and that's totally okay. But I love the giving part. But it also just, I mean, the universe has got a great way of working itself out. These people who don't think this way, right? I'm, I'm, I'm in my job. I'm not going to take two minutes out to call that person or they sent me a job that I'm totally not interested in. These are the same people that when they need a job or they need to network with somebody or they need to make a sale at a company, these are the same people that wonder why no one calls them back. The friends don't do anything for them. Why is it that everybody I call is just, you know, 
you know, butting me out or whatever it is. So you got to think about this is actually a golden opportunity for you to give the recruiter something and everybody has a network. I don't care what you say. You people make me laugh when you say, I don't know anybody. Really? You've been working for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and you don't know anybody? I don't care if you have their number or not. You, you probably remember their name. So just think about that, that, that just conceptually, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you here exactly how to do this, but I, I just I can't drive this point home enough. Even inside the Mile Walk Academy, when we get questions or on the Facebook page or now the LinkedIn page that we have about, hey, a recruiter contacted me, should I actually take the time to... You know, and the answer is hell yes every time because that's your opportunity to give somebody something, referrals, whatever. And at a minimum, you can figure out and, and ask them what's going on in the employment market. What is, where do the trends look like? What are the hot spaces? What are they noticing? What are companies hiring? What are the issues nowadays? What are the mediums companies are using? I don't, whatever it is. Now, here's what I want you to do. When you are approaching them, here again, breaking this up. So when you approach them, so now they have not contacted you, you want to reach out to them. Here's what I want you to do. Conceptually, I don't mind that you reach out to them. There's nothing wrong with that. But consider it a supplement, not the primary. We, we get a number of people uh, who you know, email me, they want to join my job search boot camp. I've been trying to get a hold of recruiters. They're not getting a hold of me. I contacted 100 of them. Just, it's not a great use of your time. The percentages are incredibly low. I've already given them to you. Why would you spend 80% of your search time trying to contact people when you have a 1% chance of actually getting placed by them? So just make it a supplement. Then the other thing, offer them something. So when you when you contact them, you gotta, you gotta give them something. Oop, I think I missed one of my cards. Actually, I, I, I can't find that card. I'm guessing it's, oh, here it is. I want you to email them only. Do not call them. I don't care if my mother gave you my name and said, call him. Don't call me and leave me a voicemail message. Don't call executive recruiters and leave them a voicemail message. They will never call you back, even if they don't have any context on you. If they can't look at your resume, if they can't look at where you're going, or they don't have some kind of frame of reference, it is going to be a long time, if ever, you get a return call from them. Email them. Email them so you actually can do all of these things that I'm talking about. So when you email them and you're going to offer them something, here's what I'm talking about. If you target somebody and you notice that they recruit for positions in your space, or you were given a name by my mother or whoever and said, go, go call this person or email this person or whatever, however it is that you got there. Email them and say, hey, I want to reach out. I got your name from so-and-so. Or I noticed that you recruit for positions like this and companies in my space. You know, I, I'm, sure you, you know I'm sure you have a lot going. And, and, and assuming that you are somebody who does this, I'd love to share my resume with you. Attach the resume. And if you'd you know, be so kind as to take a look at it and let me know if there are any opportunities that you're currently searching for that you think I would be suitable for or would be suitable for me, however you want to phrase it, I would be happy to discuss. If that's not the case, please keep my credentials in your system should anything arise. In the meantime, if you'd like to have a conversation, I would be happy to offer you my network and any referrals to people who fit the positions you are searching for or something like that. Put it in your language. But that's the point. I'm emailing you. I noticed or I was referred. Here's my resume. Let me know if there's anything that you have. And assuming that there isn't, I'd welcome the call and offer you my network. All right. Now you're at least giving me something. Now, now I know that you are the willing type and you have probably increased your chances of getting a call from that recruiter by 100%. I'm not saying it's 100% that they're going to call you. You're going to double your chances or triple or quintuple your chances. But you've got a much better shot that when I get an email like that, I recognize that this person appreciates what I do, came at me in a manner that shows me they have the right perspective and they're willing to build a relationship. What's wrong with a 10-minute call to that person? 
that's very different because I know I'm going to get off that call likely with, you know, maybe I have positions that are somewhat related, but not exactly what that is right now. And if the person did their homework and they know the type of positions that I recruit for, I would definitely call them back. I would definitely call them back. And then here, don't expect much though. This is the big problem. This is a big source of pain in anything in your life, but especially when it comes to these people. All right. So there's that. Now, if you get contacted, if you get contacted, here's what I want you to do. Return the message no matter what. Return the message no matter what. It doesn't matter that they missed your profile. The goal of their message to you is to get you on the phone. Your goal of receiving a message like that or sending them a message is to get them on the phone. Nothing can happen if you are not calling them back or you are not helping them or they, there, there's nothing that could come of that. The only way a positive outcome can occur, whether now or in the future, is if you actually have a conversation. And do not think for one minute that because I sent you an email today that next month I'm willing to talk to you because you got back to me in a month. No, that ship has sailed. Strike while it's hot. Strike while we just sent it to you. Show me you're responsive. That matters. But now if you call me in a month, I'm going to think something went wrong. So just, just remember. And then the other thing is just listen and enjoy. Take your time to go through, hear them out, what they do. It's okay to say, hey, you know, my background is a little bit more this way. It appeared as though you were reaching out about this. Let's, you know, have at it. Let me understand it. Let me share with you a little bit about who I am and what I want. And then, and then talk about, go wherever the conversation will bring you. Hey, listen, okay, so it doesn't sound like this is a fit. Let me help you network. Give, then immediately try to give them something. Don't you worry about, you know, I got to, you know, call my friends and any of that crap. It doesn't matter. If your friends don't want to talk to them, they won't talk to them. You need to do your job right at the moment. Otherwise, you will not get that chance to give them that gift again. You're going to go off. You're going to get busy. So as you're listening to them, just start trading information. Make sure, make sure you share your info. This is very important. They cannot be a scout for you while you go off and either be happy or go continue to look for other jobs if they don't have your information. Don't be tight with your lips. Give them everything you want. Give them your resume. Give them everything that they would need to know. What compensation range am I looking at and all that good stuff, okay? And then, I know, I mean, I hit this one here, but you got to you got to give them referrals. Don't overthink this. Get them anybody that is remotely close to what they're doing. Maybe those people can take them to the next level. It makes no difference. Your goal is to give in that session. You're planting seeds for the long term. And yes, it would be wonderful if you ended up getting engaged with their client. And let's talk about that. So, all right, hey, you are a fit. I contacted you. You contacted me back. You are a fit. I'm going to get you engaged with my client. Now, here's some things I want you to ask right away. Okay, so we had our discussion. We went through a bunch of stuff. I love you. You love me. You like the opportunity. We're going to go at this together. Okay? First thing you want to do before you move is ask the recruiter, what kind of relationship do you have with the company? So I'm talking about, you know, been working with them a while. Are you the only one searching? What you know? What's the landscape look like? Have you placed anybody at the company, or is this a new relationship? If you've placed people at the company, who have you placed at the company? What types of positions? Are you? I'm a product manager. You've placed salespeople at the company. Okay, that's fine. Um, then you start be thinking. Okay, well, okay. How long have you been with this hiring official? That sounds great, so you know the company, but do you actually know the person that I'm going to be interacting with? So we got a company, we got we got a client we've been working with five years. We've placed people in the sales and marketing area, we've placed people in the alliances area, um, we have we've uh, are now recruiting for people on the delivery side, the project managers, and so forth. I know the operations person, I know the head of sales and marketing because I put them there, I know one of the sales people, right, the alliances manager, I don't know the prof uh, director of professional services. That's okay, but this is the kind of dialogue you want to have. Why do you want to have it? Because one of the things that's going to stress you out is when I say, hey, 
this is great. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go put you in front of my client, and then I go and then I come back and I say, hey, they don't want to talk to you because I didn't have the clout. I didn't have the credibility. Versus, nope. I'm telling you, when I talk to my client. She's going to want to talk to you. Why? Because she's going to talk to anybody that I put in front of her because I got a hit rate like you wouldn't believe. And she trusts me. That's different. Okay. You just want to have an idea because all of that is going to set the tone for what you're going to be doing as you're working with the recruiter through that process from the time they present you. And you need to make sure you give them everything that they need. Okay. Number one concept, give them everything that they ask for at this stage if they have committed to putting you in front of their client and they should not put you in front of their client unless you've given them permission, unless you've given them permission. So make sure that give them everything that they want. Then be responsive, and I mean hyper-responsive. When candidates are not returning my call to get scheduled, when my client has given me three dates next week for them, I don't care that they're next week. I need to know like now, when you can meet or when you can't or whatever. If you're not being responsive, you're sending signals to the company, to the hiring company, just like if you were going in on your own, that you're not that interested. It's not a good, it's not good form. You need to be responsive. Believe me, recruiters aren't calling you to chitty chat. They're calling you because they need something or they need to tell you something or something of that nature or they need to find out something from you or whatever it is. So just be responsive, you are sending messages and don't think for one second that I will not turn to my client and say, you know what, I'm so sorry, I've called so-and-so three times and she's not getting back to me. Why am I gonna tell her that? Well, number one, I don't want her to think I'm being lazy. Number two, I wanna tell her everything within reason because I I want her to believe me when I say something, right? I need her to believe me when I tell her something. I'm not gonna lie to her but I I need to make sure that I'm earning her trust and especially somebody that I've been working with for a long time. But even if it's somebody that I haven't been working with for a long time, I'm going to do that because I want them to know what's happening behind the scenes. You're sending signals. Okay. The other thing, you got to be honest about everything, about whatever it is that they ask you. When I ask you, who else are you interviewing with? Who are the companies? What are the positions? Where are you in the process? Do you really want to travel? Do you not? Do you this, that, whatever? It it doesn't do you any good if you are not being open and honest. It it, it really is going to hurt you in the long run. Then you're not going to earn my trust or the trust of the company that who is hiring you. So it is okay. And I, in return, as an executive recruiter, need to be honest with you. And I need to let you know. There are other candidates in the process. Here's who they are and so on. I wrote this one out. There's a lot of things that go along with being professional, showing up on time, showing up to your interviews on time getting in touch for the debrief and prep calls on time, doing your homework, putting your questions together, and all that stuff. This matters hugely. We talked about the long game. Think long term. Now, why am I reiterating this here? Well, when you work with me, everybody gets this little speech from me as soon as we are get on the phone the first time, first call. I never met you before. This, this is going to be in the recruitment call. I care more about the relationship with you than I ultimately care about the outcome. Yes, I would love for, you know, my client to hire you and they would be happy and you would be happy and I would be happy and all that good stuff. But, but there there are odds that go against that. All right. So it's difficult to get hired, right? Boom, boom. So I care more about our relationship in the long term. Yes, I would love for you to get that job, but... What's really going to bother me is if you do something that makes me look bad or you're lying to me or any of that because then I'm never going to work with you again. And remember, if you're thinking long term, I will come back to you. We've had individuals that we've recruited. They've gotten into the interview process for whatever reason they decided to pull back. Maybe, you know, the spouse lost a job. Things got risky. There's a million things that can go wrong. As long as they were open, honest, communicated with me, showed up on time and all that good stuff. I would go back to them in a second, and there have been a lot of people that have, where that has happened that I have then placed a year or two or three years later. So think long term. You are only burning the bridge, not if you reject an offer, but if you do it in, in, in bad form. 
take advantage of the preps and the debriefs. So every executive recruiter should prepare you before you go into an interview. It could be five minutes. It could be 50 minutes. It could be two hours, okay, that they prep you. It doesn't make any difference. Make sure you show up to the prep on time. Make sure you come to the prep ready. And then when you get done with the interviews, you want to make sure that you call the recruiter immediately. Why do you want to do that? Well, can you imagine the situation where you go in and you interview with, with my client and then you get done and then my client calls me like they're trained to do as well, right? I got to call Andy, let him know how it went because Andy said, please call me, right? And they're calling me and you haven't called me or you haven't called the recruiter. Now, what I do is I actually don't pick up the phone, but a lot of people pick up the phone and here's what happens. Hey, well, I interviewed with someone, so everything was great, but she said this, I was a little concerned about that. Now I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know what that was like. Now I'm only getting one side. I've, I'm flat-footed. I don't know what to say. I can't dampen it if I need to, right? I can't clarify it and so on. So it's important. You don't need to think about it for three days. You don't need to process it. You don't need to go sit in the corner and close out the lights. I mean, just what's your reaction? What happened? How do you feel? All those good things, they want to know. So make sure you do that. And you need to throughout the entire process. So that's individually across the interview and interviews. But throughout the entire interview process, take advantage of their relationship. This is what gives you the biggest leg up. When I say, hey, this is what this client is like. Here's what she loves. Here's what she doesn't. These are the four things she's going to care about. These are the success metrics for the position. You ought to see this prep stuff, right? Imagine knowing all this before you get in there. That is somebody who's worked with the client before or has worked with these types of clients before. You need to take advantage of that. Leverage their relationship and take their guidance throughout. These are eight biggies that you should do all the time. And I understand that everybody is different level of caliber and some of you are going to meet some executive recruiters that are super sharp and some of you are going to meet executive recruiters that ain't that great. But the fact of the matter is if you get engaged in one of their processes with their clients, you want to do everything you can to work with them, let them negotiate for you, let them feed you the information about the interviewers and all that good stuff. It will substantially increase your odds. All right, so I'm not going to recap that. That's 45 minutes, but I hope that gives you some perspective. I think we got some really great questions in the chat, which we're going to go to in a minute, but I have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one I think is going to make everybody's life easier, and so I want to I show you these things. So if you, are on, if you are here watching me live, we're going to go to that. If you are on the recording, I'll see you next week. Uh, but for everybody else who's here, I want to show you something really quick and then I'm going to take a whole bunch of questions. All right, so I and Kara decided that we would love for everybody to know when we're live and what the, you know, what the calendar of events is and we want you to be up to date. We get loads of emails, when's live office hours, when's the next special event, hey, I just subscribed to this event, I'm on the wait list. When's the boot camp? When's your leadership monthly? We get all this stuff, okay? So what we decided we would do uh, is create this calendar. And I wanna show you uh, where it is and maybe Kara could actually drop the link in the, um, in the chat here. And let me show you. So if you haven't been to the Mile Walk Academy page here in uh, recently, Check it out. This is just the front page of, of the Mile Walk Academy. It's just milewalkacademy.com. Uh, there's you know menu item up here to a few quick links, the blog and so forth. There's tons of really good stuff. There's challenges and all that good stuff, downloads and, and whatever. Up here at the top, there's this thing called Live Calendar. If you click it, um, it's going to take you to a page on the Mile Walk Academy platform milewalk academy slash calendar so that's the link and we've populated in here all the different live dates so this is a google calendar and you could look at it by week or you could look at it by month or you could open it up you know you could see the link for today um, and so if you want um, you know, we've got live office hours for the next, I don't know, several weeks. We've got a leadership monthly here. We've got the boot camps starting tomorrow. 
Uh, we've got actually one thing I want to show you if you guys are so inclined. I'm going to be in, uh, in, in on June 7th in San Francisco. Um, if you check this out, you can meet me at the pub, <laughs> Gier Deli Square, for a drink at, uh, well, actually, it's 3 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock San Francisco time. But all this stuff is pretty cool. And down here, there's instructions for you to actually subscribe. So all you need to do is take this link and copy it. You know, take the whole link and copy it. And then here's the instruction, whether you have Google Calendar, Outlook Calendar, Apple iCal, or whatever. And then uh, we've given you the exact uh, instructions to basically subscribe. And so from week to week, day to day, as we add things to the calendar, you will be up to date. And, uh, and so this is our first one. It, it is a mixture of, of paid and free. It will always say free if it's free. But that's, you know, that's kind of cool. And then I did mention uh, tomorrow we're starting a four-week blitz uh, for live coaching sessions for the boot camp. And I I'm not going to go through the whole boot camp with you. Uh, I just want to let you know you got, you got about a day. And these are the things I want to point out really quick. And this is something that I don't know that a lot of people get. You see this ongoing live coaching. When you... The boot camp has five main modules. They're all recorded now. We're in the process of changing the format, and you are going to be, anybody who, who enrolls in the boot camp just one time will can come to any and all of those coaching sessions forever and ever. So for a one-time fee, you will, you will be able to come to these live sessions. Uh, some months of the year, there are four of them. Some months of the year, there are one or two of them, but there's about 24. So for the rest of your life, you'll have this. So when you know a lot of these boot campers, they go off, they get their sweet jobs, and then they come back and they ask career development related questions. But you get the ongoing support and all that good stuff. Here are the five modules. They're starting, marketing, searching, interviewing and negotiating, you get an all access pass. But then one other thing that I wanna point out, because these have been hugely popular, there is a, an extra resume writing video in the program that highlights all the exceptions, whether you were a stay-at-home mom or dad, whether you're a contractor, whether you've had a, a layoff from work, whether you're returning to the workforce, uh, all kinds of different nuances where companies are getting acquired. And then there's a whole extra job searching video with a booklet with 10 networking templates for every type of networking situation that you need, whether it's in person or online, what it is to say exactly to build a relationship with somebody, surface an opportunity or a job through somebody, get connected with somebody you met after an event, whatever it is, I've written all 10 of them. People are crushing it with that. And for those of you that are on my subscription list, you're probably seeing that uh, in the emails. Um, and then there's also a huge section on how to evaluate small and mid-sized companies. You have a, a booklet, you have a checklist, you have the questions to ask what to investigate as it relates to their finances, resources, commitment levels, risk profile, all of these things that oftentimes are not in the public domain. Um, it's a really, really great program. And you know, I don't want to go through all this because I want to get to your questions. One other thing we did, we have a private LinkedIn group now. So people are, are, are jumping in on that. That's pretty awesome. I do love giving this away, this Career Accelerator program. It's really neat. You know, first 90 days, getting ready for your promotion, idea generation, organizational skills, performance reviews, and so on. You can check all this out. It's guaranteed 30 days. And then this I do want to show you. In, you know, in May and June, these are all the times. If you can make it, awesome. If you can't make it, you can send me your questions in advance and I will record them for you live. Uh, it's, it's really a pretty sweet, um, a pretty sweet schedule between now and August. And summertime is kind of tough, right, with, with, uh, with, with finding a job. So there's a lot of FaceTime uh, with me, and, and these coaching sessions now are going, you know, we're here, you know, in May. These are every Friday. Then there's one in June, and then there's five weeks in a row between July and August. Uh, these are going to be highlighted teaching, so short teachings, and then a couple hours or 90 minutes or a couple hours on your questions. And we do that on the Zoom platform. It's all recorded for you. 
and we identify what questions were asked and when they were asked so you can kind of speed through them if you want but it is really really a great uh, program and then one other thing I wanted to show you I was kind of debating but I I, I want to DB this is such an awesome uh, quote a lot of people say well you know you give away so much stuff how do you know is there more that I can learn I get a lot of these questions inevitably I get a dozen of these questions every time we roll it but this is somebody he got in the boot camp in April David is awesome this was quite a lengthy email he sent me with an awesome picture of himself I loved it but I just I wanted to show this to you I wasn't sure if I would get any additional value over the 80 YouTube videos I'd already watched my fears were unfounded the boot camp goes much deeper and connects you with what you should do and why you are doing it and then understanding why has given me a strategy and so on. This, this, you know, the steps that are outlined for you, there is a structure to this that I, I dare say is second to none. And I know this because I get emails every day from people who've gotten in it and what they're finding, people that have tried other trainers programs, people who are trying to piece it together on their own, you don't need to go this alone. And I mean, think about it, 24 coaching sessions a year that you can have where you can show up and if you can't make the sessions, you can always send me your stuff. Plus you have access to me in the training system which you can go into the comment section and in in, in, in in at each video and just ask me whatever you need to and obviously there's a very high priority on this because you're you'd be a paying member of the of the academy so i hope you enjoy that i hope you don't mind me sharing that we're starting tomorrow at 11 central noon eastern even if you can't make it it's still a great it's still a great package uh you know you in, and if you get in now you're going to get you're going to get a blitz of schedule, you know, live sessions between now and the next, say, I don't know, 10, 12 weeks. So I hope you, in, in, you know, you get in and enjoy it. All right, let's go through, uh, let me go through. So Kara's not beeping at me, which means everything is good. And let me see, Jonathan Payne, hey, I was excited for today's session too. Uh, Jonathan Payne, a third-party recruiter requires references, but I never needed them before. Who is the best as to how? Well, first off, it's not that a third-party recruiter requires references. The company on behalf of which they are working requires the references. Recruiters, third-party recruitment firms that are telling you that they need references to check on you, that's bunk. The third-party recruiter should be evaluating you and deeply. Okay, so if they are asking for references, they are often, off, often asking for references so they can expand their network. That is code for, will you please send me people who I can call and potentially recruit? That's what that is in 90% of the cases. I have never, ever, in 15 years, asked a person for a reference, ever. Why? I rely on my ability to know more about evaluating you than what? I'm gonna call some reference who's gonna speak kindly about you, right? So think about that. Now, what I would say is, hey, if you need references, I'm happy to provide those assuming we get down to the end with your client. Okay, now you ask me who should those be. Ask the, ask the hiring company, what kind of references do you want? Everyone's different. Somebody wants three bosses. Somebody wants a boss, a peer, and a subordinate. Somebody wants anybody. You know, so it doesn't, it doesn't uh, you don't need to do that up front. Don't get hoodwinked into thinking you do. And when you get down to the end, you give them the types of references that they will you know ask you for. If it's me and I'm you and I'm job searching, I get my you know, five best references. I get three bosses, maybe a peer or two. I, I have loads and loads of people who uh, have worked in my units because I've managed thousands and thousands of people at the companies that I worked at. So I would, you know, I would call on, on maybe five or six of them and say, hey, I'm in the middle of my search. Uh, if it comes to it and I need references, would you be willing to serve as one and give them the heads up? And then, and then when you do, when you do uh, need them, you immediately call them, text them, do whatever, and say, "Hey, I'm getting an opportunity. I I gave your name to this person, and I want to give you the heads up. That way, you're not waiting, and 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 they're not wait. Sorry, the the hiring company is not waiting on you to go and call your friends and get them set. 
if somebody's trying to reach me uh, and I haven't talked to them in a while and they want to use me as a reference, I'm totally cool with that. Uh, but I'm fast on my feet. And all I would need for them to tell me is, okay, you know, who is the company and who is the person? What, do you, what, did you, what position did you get? And I'd be able to match it up from there. But most people... Uh, aren't going to be able to do that. They're going to need a little more background and, and, and you should also be filling them in on the kinds of things that were important during the interview process. Hey, they kept asking me about this. They kept asking me about that. That might come up. Okay, so you know that, that's what I would do there. Varun, how you doing? Uh, question here. Good to see how, uh, good to see you. How do you get the recruiter to act in your best interest when they are working on behalf of the company? And this includes your salary negotiation. Uh, okay, couple things here. Great, great, great question. First thing is the recruiter, I want to fill the position as fast as humanly possible right? So as long as you are all those things that I talked about, responsive, professional, you show up on time, you do your homework. When I say read interview in intervention, you do. You get your questions and you do all this stuff. Believe me, I am, I am working on both of your best interests. And the recruiter wants to make the match. And the recruiter, while most of them Actually, I think I saw this somewhere in there. Somebody was asking about how recruiters get paid. Most recruiters are getting paid a percentage of your salary or overall compensation package. The more you earn, the more they earn. Okay. However, the recruiter does not want to lose the sale. And the recruiter doesn't care if they get two grand less or five grand less. They don't really care about that. They, they want to make the right match. You know what's really, really bad is the recruiter making a match and then that relationship not working out. Uh, that's the worst because now you've invested a lot of time, a lot of money. The client is unhappy. you got a candidate that's unhappy and you likely are going to have to refill it at no cost. Okay. So, uh, and no, and without the client paying for it. Okay. So, so believe me, the recruiter is mediating in everybody's best interest or should be. And from a salary negotiation standpoint, typically the more you earn, the more they earn. So from that perspective, your interests are aligned. However, the recruiter will often recognize where that breaking point is, meaning who's going to get pushed over the edge and who's going to be miffed if, you know, if I go $1 more this way or that way. So just if, as, as long as you stick to what I gave you in the, in the teaching portion of this session, I think you'll do great. The recruiter will love you. Be professional. Always respond. All that good stuff. I never get bummed out when uh, we just we had an individual. It's a rare situation. We had an individual reject an offer uh, to one of our clients a couple of weeks back. Here's what pissed me off. We're working, 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 working. I've spent no less than 15, 16 hours with the candidate over the life of the recruitment process. Everything's good. My, they have a session on a Friday. On a Friday, last session, then offers come in Monday. Okay? This is like, I'm just dialed, sealed, delivered. Candidate doesn't call me. Okay? Monday morning, calls me and says, well, we got this other opportunity that came up. They came out of nowhere, which was not true, because he said I had been interviewing. I said, okay, if anything changes with that other company, you let me know. No problem, but he didn't. Then all of a sudden, this other company wants to give him an offer. Then it was a it was a brutal week of back and forth and all this BS, and then he took the other job. Now, I wouldn't care that he took the other job. I was upset because it came out of nowhere. You could have called me You could any day of the week, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Every recruiter would love to hear from you whenever you have a minute and let them know. That's the kind of stuff that drives recruiters crazy. As long as you don't do stuff like that and you're just honest, say, hey, I get this other thing, it's starting to heat up. You say that the moment it starts to heat up, not after you go through another round or two and then let me know you're gonna get an offer, right? So so that's the kind of stuff that drives us crazy. But I, I, don't, I don't think you're gonna have trouble. Gian, you're welcome. Adam L. First live session, Adam L. Hey, man, good to have you. Can we all give Adam L. 
a big live office hours hug. And can you all please, if you are enjoying this, give me a little hit on the like button or whatever the YouTube is calling it now. Uh, I think YouTube is, is going to be getting rid of the not like button. But uh, anyway, great to great to have you. Your copy of interview intervention shipped. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, Pansy. Leticia, how you doing? A recruiter once admitted to my husband that the way they make their money is by taking a portion of the candidate's salary. Is this typical business practice? So let's talk language here. Leticia, they don't take a portion of the candidate's salary. The candidate's salary is the candidate's salary, but I think I know what you meant. Yes, that is very true. Now, there are many, many different arrangements. I didn't want to go into this in the talk, but I'm actually really glad you asked this. So whether you are a retained firm or a contingent firm, let's take the contingent firms first. Usually, there is a percentage, and then the percentage is agreed to, and it's either agreed to on the base salary or the total package. So if somebody earns $100,000 in salary but has a $50,000 bonus or a $10,000 sign-on bonus, sometimes the companies will only pay a percentage of the salary. Sometimes the companies will pay a percentage of the all-in number or the targeted number. Sometimes uh, companies will vary their pay. Sometimes it's uh, a company will earn 15%, sometimes it's 20, 25, 30, 33, and so on. Okay, it depends on the reputation of the recruitment firm. It depends on the relationship with the customer. It depends on a lot of things. So uh, that is true. On the retainers that we do, Milewalk does. What we do is, uh, and by the way, Milewalk used to be 80% contingent, 20% retained so we would have both kinds now we are 100 percent retained we will not do any searching or recruiting for you unless you pay up front a third of the estimated fee that we agree to so we might say hey uh we're looking for a two hundred thousand dollar a year person and the fee is going to be sixty thousand dollars so you're going to pay us 20 now and then you know if we produce a candidate and you hire the candidate right away you're going to pay me 40. If you, if you see multiple candidates from us, after you see three, you're going to pay the next progress payment. And then at the, at the end, you're going to pay the balance of 30% of the base salary or 30% of the total comp or whatever it might be. And then we square up at the end. That's another way of doing it. These are very common uh, structures. So, Or we could just say, it doesn't matter what you pay that person, our fee is. $50,000 or whatever. So a lot of, uh, of companies do it that way as well. So so yes, that is true. It's not an admission. It's kind of commonly known that this is the way it works. Nikki Proctor Walden, great to have you. Another newbie. Evelyn is a new boot camper from New York. Great to have you. Mom is here. Hey, Mom, I was only kidding about those referrals. You know if you refer anybody... You know, number one son is going to call him back. Uh, but, I, you know, I was just sort of trying to get my point across. <laughs> and right next to La Chivita is my favorite boot camper name, Lorenza. How are you? And Nancy, great to see you. Adam is, from, oh, you're from Canada. Oh, that's great. Yes, Pablo, welcome to the boot camp. I see you joined this week. Great to have you. Hope you're going to make it tomorrow. Nancy, Sunny Tucson, need a job, laid off, total bummer, been watching. I know you have. You've been a great contributor. Davida. Oh, Davida. If we have any more rain, my bedroom is going to be in that lake behind me. Uh, I kid you not. My poor doggies are always bummed out too. Fabs, how you doing? From Germany. What should I say when networking on LinkedIn to uncover a job opportunity and someone says just to look in the website and apply for a job online? What I would do, uh, you know, not to sound this way, but the this is the kind of example when I was mentioning about the networking templates that I give. This is the kind of stuff that we we give you. But but in this case, if you are trying to network with somebody who actually responded to you in this case, because to be fair to you, because you asked it, because you asked it, um, if I emailed you and I was looking for a job. And you said to me, hey, Andy, can you just go to the company website and apply? Then I would 
respond back to you and say, I will do that. Is there a name of a recruiter or HR person who is in charge of this particular role so that I can follow up with them after I submit my resume? And don't put your resume in there yet. Then get the name of the person. Then if you get the name of the person and you're successful, don't put your resume in the applicant tracking system at all costs. Then email that person directly. Figure out how to get that person's email using hunter.io and verifyemailaddress.org. You can check those sites out. It's pretty self-explanatory. Once you have the person's name, how to get their email address, and that's what I would do. And if all else failed and they were not getting back to me, I would hunt down either the other targeted bosses or the recruiter or the HR person or somebody in that capacity and I would try to target them and email them my, my resume directly. That's what I would do. Nancy, thank you for that. Robert Perez, how you doing, man? Nikki's got a question. I have a question regarding a mistake that I gave away difficult time, regarding a mistake that I gave away difficult time discovering before I accepted a position. What are some signs that an organ that an organization is a safe haven for narcissistic people? Okay, well that's a little bit rough, but what I would suggest is you're in luck. Because, Nikki, two days ago, so my answer to you is go watch this video that I just released two days ago, and I shot it, I don't know when I shot it, but I released it two days ago about Eight questions to ask yourself before accepting a new job. And two things that you should do. In addition to that, the first thing that I would do is I would look at a video I did months back, probably earlier in the year, titled How to Choose the Right Job. That's a great starting point. And then as a, as a supplement, last minute checks to surface the red flags be, when they're supposed to be surfaced, which is before you accept the role. So, and Nikki, I don't know if you are on my email list. I know you said you are new here, um, but if you are on my email list, uh, I sent a, every Tuesday morning at 6.30 Central Time where I live, I send an email to my community that was in there this past week. So if you haven't seen the email, check it out. If you are not subscribed, please do. Otherwise, check the check my YouTube channel and just check the recent videos that just went out. Um, I mean, it literally it literally is the like the most recent one because it just came out a couple days ago. Claire T, great to see you. Hey from Cleveland, GFGS. Sarah, how you doing? Uh, let me see. I'm assuming that's my Sarah. I hope you got my email this morning in response to your. Uh, question about where to place that thing. Uh, hi, Andy. It was suggested to me that we should all write your name on our foot like in the movie Toy Story. Mm. I'm not... It's been a while since I've seen Toy Story and Andy or whatever I think that was Tom Hanks's... Um, I'm not... I'm not... I'm not I'm, I am not. I think I'm missing the joke. I mean, write... I'll write your name meaning my name or your name. Uh, I'm not... I'm not... I'm not sure, but whatever, whatever, helps. <laughs> I would bring in my stuff, bring in the book, the like osmosis and you know, you're going to hear me talking and you've heard me talk a lot. So, all right, Ten Tanella, how are you? SLK from Atlanta, Pansy, I'm excited for this session. I'm always excited for these. Kathleen Phillips, how are you? Yes, I love my dose of Kathleen too. Carrie Free, look at all these ladies. Oh my God. Krista, yes, and that San Francisco thing, I know, we say, I keep saying it's June 7th. Uh, uh, Christ, Christina, Krista, is, was kind enough to pick out the place and organize this for us. Thank you. Adam L. I was asked in a pre-screening interview last year, what else can you tell me about yourself that's not on your resume? What was the interviewer looking for? Personal, extracurricular. I would immediately, I would immediately, I, I can't stand, it's not your fault. I can't stand those questions. Like the interviewer, so first of all, people, when an interviewer asks you that, it's dumber than dumb because a, a great interviewer has a series of important questions identified that help him or her elicit the information they need to know to determine if you are a fit in their company based on 
designed and deliberate evaluation of you. If I turn it over to you and you get to talk about anything you want to talk about, I run the risk of wasting a lot of my interview time as the reviewer and not getting what I need. So Adam, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an answer and I'm going to refer you to a video. So when you're in the pre-screen, the, the best things that you can give to the recruiter or the screener or whoever are what, what skills do you need to know that I have and let me make sure that I point them and are there any other skills that are not on my resume that you need and let me know and let me know and I'll let you know if I have them. The other thing is are when you say is there anything else about me that's not on my resume? Are you interested in the things that are of interest to me? My requirements. Okay? So Adam, if you have not seen how to choose the right job, I'd say the same thing uh, to you uh, that I just mentioned about going and looking at that video, make sure you got all your requirements. I would share those. But I would probably say and I wouldn't I wouldn't go personal no matter what. I would say are, are you interested in additional skills I might have, requirements that are important to me, or any extracurricular activities that I think are germane to me doing a better job or being a better fit for the company? And I would ask her that. Now, the video I would refer you to is the Tell Me About Yourself video or the Walk Me Through Your Resume video. Those are two very popular videos on my YouTube channel. I would check those out, and that's what I would do because I don't, I don't like questions like that. You do not want to start talking without a roadmap for where you're going. When people do stuff like this to you, which is total crap, you need you need to rein them in. And if you don't rein them in, that's your that's within your control. Hey, are you interested in additional skills I have, additional extracurricular uh, activities that are germane, or any requirements that would help you know if I'm aligned culturally or if the company's a good fit for me? That's what I would do. That's what I would do there. Avo, how you doing? Great to see you from LA. Hope you got clarification on that email you sent us. We saw that. Robert Latson, how are you? Thank you. You are you are welcome, my friend. I love this stuff. Phil Newton, hey, good to see you. Carrie Freeman, my prescriptive job offer, made me wait 30 days, called money to tell me they cannot hire anyone right now. That's very common. Very common, Carrie. And I know because this was a carryover from like last week or the week before, whenever it was. And uh, you know, as the as the days go on, it's it's less likely that they come through. All right, Sarah, if we did target our or if we did our targeted networking on LinkedIn and go on a coffee date, yay, what do we say when they ask the question, tell me about yourself? No job position posted. I would tell them about you and your background and things that are of interest to you. Remember, I mean, this is a if it truly is just a networking opportunity, um, and, and 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 networking opportunities could be a number of things. You might contact me. I might be receptive to getting together with you. And there may be an opportunity at Mile Walk or one of my client firms or whatever that you fit. If I ask you, hey, just kind of let me know about you, I generally mean at that point, just let me know about you. Like, wh you know, what do you do? What's, what's of interest? You could start with your headline. You know, hey, this is my focus. Um, but I, and I've, I've done it in large companies and small companies. But I really love doing this. I would start it there. And I would not like walk somebody through my resume if it's a networking date. I would just say, hey, this is about me. You know what? I was really passionate about starting my own firm. You know, I, I got out of IT and into recruitment, and that really led to me writing books and blogging. And now I'm loving what I'm doing because I, you know, get, you know, I'm using these platforms to reach many, many millions of people, and I love helping people. I generally, I mean, I, I genuinely mean that, and so on. Like I would just kind of give them the highlights. That's what I would do. Um, let me see. Sorry, I am. All right. Hello from France, Chris. You are welcome. Lorenza, have two interviews next week? Yes. One of the interviews is for an interim role, 9 to 12 months. Is the prep for an interim role different? No. Uh, more skills based rather than culture? No. Actually, so this is the way I look at this. Lorenzo, great question. So for a lot, and this is becoming 
and I don't say a lot of you, I just mean it's becoming more common where companies are, you know, and especially somebody like you who's fairly, you know, senior. So companies are, uh, you know, they're kind of a try before you buy. Um, and, and just it's becoming more prevalent and people are just more open to it and companies are more open to it because a lot of, uh, I mean, let's be honest, to, to have an employee nowadays is more expensive than ever before. It, 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 it truly, it truly is. And so if, if I was going to re-enter the workforce and I was going to shut all my, my stuff down and I was going to go and I had a nine to 12 month opportunity where somebody wanted me to be a contractor or an interim, whatever it might be. I would treat it like it was my home, meaning I would treat it like it was my full-time job. I would, you know, I mean, I, I would, I would do everything to try to fit culturally. I would, ev- meaning, evaluate them to know whether I fit culturally. I would get in there, and so Lorenzo, you've been through the boot camp with me. You've been through the career accelerator program. Not only would I tell you to prepare the same way, but going into the role, I would treat it as though it was a full-time role, and that you, you would be uh, highly, highly. Uh, focused on those first 90 days, the metrics that you want to hit, um, and 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 say to them, you know, is there an opportunity that this could turn into something full time? And if it, it would in nine to 12 months, what would I need to do over the course of this period to attain that? And so on. So it's not just. I mean, I would treat it all the same way. I would treat it all the same way, especially for something that's nine months. It's not a short one. Uh, it could be a year, but no, same. Christy B, Christy B, you might be, actually, I don't, you might not be the newest boot camper, but you are definitely in the top five newest boot campers because you just joined like within an hour. And uh, that was awesome. And welcome from Dubai. And I had to look up the time zone difference. So I hope that helped. And I appreciate the email that you sent me after. And I love having you in the program. I think you're going to enjoy it. As an ex agency recruiter for eight years, I completely agree that they are not all bad. They're not. They're not. The, the, the reason they get such a bad rap is because everybody takes everything personally. Like, they're not calling me back because it's me. You know, I emailed them this nice resume. I got this great background. And it just, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with you. And it's hard for people to get. I see Kara deleting a bunch of <laughs> Hey, by the way, Kara, I don't know. Did we even put the boot camp? Um, link in the description because if we didn't, uh, please do and maybe you're way ahead of me and hopefully we put the calendar link so everybody can get subscribed and you know where to show up on live office hours and you get your reminders and your alerts. You got to make sure that when you sync the, or that you subscribe to the Mile Walk Academy calendar, you sync it frequently so that if we change times or change links, which is more likely, uh, that you have the proper spot or you're in the proper spot. Adam Stark, hey Andy, I hope you're well. I am. What should I do if I can't find values to back up some of my achievements, especially with money saved or raised? If you can't, so first off, um, I do, I, I'm not going to say you can't because that would be silly of me. But I would, first thing I would do is I would try to be creative. When, you know, if you implemented something, you can estimate, well, how many bodies time did it save? What was an average rate of an employee at that level? And so on. Uh, money saved. You know, if you are the accountant that reduced the closing cycle from 10 days to five days, but you really, you know, that was two, three, four years ago, two, two assignments, two companies ago, you're not sure. Well, what's wrong with saying, well, hang on. We had five people in the department. Average salary was a hundred grand, right? And then, you know, we saved five days. So that's eight hours times this times that. It's an estimated X amount of dollars if you save five days from five people. You could do that. Um, the, 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 the thing about the resume is you want it to be as accurate as possible, and the most important thing is that you can back up what you're putting down. I'm not going to argue with you that it was, you know, you saved 100000 or 125000 I don't, you know, tell me how you did it. That's, that's what matters most. Now, if you just have no clue, no I you know, if you're going the other way, hey, I, I built this system. And what it did was, well, we were we were we had the Salesforce system, and we were able to secure. We had six, you know, think about it this way: we had. I'm a technologist. We had a sales. We had a sales 
force of six people. We had a Salesforce system that we blew out and I implemented a new one for them. We still had six people. But all of a sudden, the salespeople were able to close twice as much, twice as many deals because they had this new system, which is more efficient. It gave them prompters. They built better relationships. They were invited to more RFPs and so on. You could talk about, well, what was the revenue? You know, you know how, how many or how many additional leads did it generate or something like that. Like these are the kind of things that you guys need to be thinking about that translate into quantifications. Now, if you absolutely have no, like you can't figure out the dollars, you can't do that. Talk about what you do know. I saved five days from five people. I, you know, you got to come up with some way. You can't just say, I saved a lot of time. I saved a lot of money. You can't do that. So give it your best. Keith, how are you? Hope you're doing well, my man. Matt Ryan, I'm assuming you are not the quarterback because he probably sells his, t his name with two T's. Greetings, Annie. Would you approach preparing for a digital interview differently than a face-to-face -face interview? Matt, two answers here. Your first answer in the prep is no, meaning everything that I've given you, every you know, I don't know how new a, um, I don't know how new a uh, a member you are to my community, but um, everything I've given you, three keys to ace any job interview, all the videos, the webinar, all the videos I've given you, all the stuff I've given you, do that. When it comes to a video interview, I have a specific video interviewing, uh, video interviewing tips for job seekers. Uh, it's got a yellow card. It is a, it's 20 tips of everything you should do to crush the video interview. And that's taking advantage and of my knowledge of what it's like to be on camera and be in front and what you should do. Um, so I would check that out. All right, hope that helps. Let me see. Karen. What is this? I wish I could do something like this, teaching this stuff, but now. <laughs> oh, God. That's great. All right. Just kind of buzzing through. We got somebody's getting a lot of deleted. Hey, Kara, you know what? If you got to delete that many you know, questions, you got to just ban the guy. Sorry, guys, I'm just zipping through. I see you guys are kibitzing with each other, which I love. Sam, how are you? All right, I got Sam at 11.23. All right, and, and just a few minute announcement. I gotta, I gotta, uh, I've got to uh, buzz out in four minutes. So uh, I'm gonna answer a question and I'm gonna, I'm gonna cap it up with a few other things. Uh, all right, so Sam, I know you have tips and techniques for networking for boot campers, but a summary would be helpful. By the way, I have three interviews upcoming, four or seven jobs. Oh, okay, great. Well, I, you know, there are certain things, folks, and, and Sam, and I appreciate you, you know, you guys are, 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 are coming, you know, here week in and week out, but, you know, I, I have to, I also have to build a business. And I mean, I think I am, and I could say that, and I mean, I could look at you in the camera and stare you in the face and say this, I got to hold some of the most difficult stuff back because I have to run a business too. Now I can say that because I feel like I, I look at some of these other trainers. I think I give away more time than anybody ever that I can find. And I don't look at trainers because I want to know what they're saying and their techniques. I just want to, I'm looking at their, their, the method to their madness. And I just feel like I'm here every week for a long time. I answer the questions. I have the live events. We put the videos out. We have the special events. We give a lot of stuff away. But there's got to be, there's got to be more, just like that David said, that, that testimony, that kind of that email I put up. That's what that's what the the, the boot camp boot campers get because they they pay they pay in they pay in so um, I appreciate you know I appreciate your sentiment. All right, let me see. Pablo, thank you for that. You know I I I. I <laughs> somebody. Um. Yeah, I, 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 I see somebody got banned. Hang on, come on, man. I want to I wanna end here on a positive note. 
Christy B. Love the give, give, get guy. It's true. Boy, this is Steven the Ghost, man. Who is this guy? All right. May Ling Gomez. Okay, let me let me get May Ling Gomez in here. May Ling, great to see you. I don't know if your your name's not that familiar to me, but ho- I don't know if you're a first time. Often after interviews, I send a thank you mail and rarely receive a response back. That's okay. It's not great, but it's okay. I take time to craft these emails so they're concise and prompt. Should I follow up a second time or do I let it go? No, let it go. So what I would for all of you, I know this is common. Don't expect these folks to get back to you. If they do, that's a good sign. That's nice. Okay. I like that. But make sure that every time you send a thank you email, you copy the recruiter or the HR person or whoever is quarterbacking the process so that those can get dropped into your, into your, uh, HR folder. And so don't be deflated. Don't be bummed out. Don't pester them. You send them what I like to do is I like to drop thank you cards in the mail as well. That, you know they open them, right? So I open all my mail. You send stuff to the P.O. box, I open it all, right? Send stuff to the house, I open it all. So I would not worry about that. I really wouldn't. I would make sure you stay in touch with the quarterback of the process who's likely the internal corporate recruiter or the HR person or maybe even the hiring official. So, all right, I hope that helps. All right, guys, I got to run. I would love to see as many of you as possible in the boot camp. If not, I'm back here next Thursday. And uh, and in the meantime, make sure you, you drop the Mile Walk Academy calendar of live events into, uh, you know, sync it up with your iCal or your Google Cal or your Outlook or whatever. It's pretty cool. You can just use the URL, follow the prompts. We give you the instructions. It's very simple. And you can, you can unsubscribe to that calendar at any time. And so uh, I guess that's it. I will see... You, well, Tuesday there'll be a video. Thursday I'll be live again. And uh, and next week, I'm also with my boot campers on Friday. So I'm, I'm with my boot campers tomorrow. So hopefully you guys will jump in. But if not, have a great weekend, have a great week, and I'll see you next week on Thursday.